Los Angeles is once again on fire, but this time things are different. The Palisades, Kenneth, Hearst, and Eaton fires are all raging in the LA metro area. Though the combined acreage of these fires is relatively small, with over 9,000 structures burned, these fires are quickly becoming some of the most destructive in state history. And January isn't exactly a normal time of year for wildfires in this region. This is even more notable since the area saw historic rainfall and even flooding just last winter. Wild theories have been flying far and wide across the internet to explain the extremity of these fires, but the real reasons are pretty clear cut if you know where to look. The severity of these fires really comes down to a fatal combination of various weather events. First, we have the dry grasses in shrubland, which saw a flurry of growth during last winter's rain before drying in the abnormally warm summer heat. This resulted in a heavily loaded fuel bed for the fires to ignite in and then consequently rapidly spread through. Next, there are the strong dry Santa Ana winds, which are sweeping through the region later in the season than they usually would. These winds damage energy infrastructure like power lines and increase the risk of fire ignition. They also make fires nearly impossible to contain. Finally, there's the fact that human development has crept closer and closer to wildlands, removing any previous fire buffer that existed between the brush-covered hills and housing developments. There's been a lot of talk about drought and how it's affected water availability for firefighting purposes, but none of that actually came into play. Yes, the drought dried out fuel sources during the spring, summer, and fall, but the intense rains last winter allowed LA to refill their drought-starved reservoirs. The reason firefighters found their hydrants running dry was due to the hydrant systems not being engineered to handle the immense strain of fighting a wildfire. The systems had enough water supply, they just could not meet the demand. There's no question that the factors which played into these fires' severity follow a trend of increasing extremes along the lines projected with atmospheric warming. Despite all the targets and talk, global emissions have continued to increase, and in 2024, they reached 60% above 1990 levels. Also, during 2024, global average temperatures crossed the 1.5 degrees Celsius ceiling that was set by the Paris Accord. The more dramatic weather which set the stage for these blazes fits the predictions by experts, who warn that scenarios like this one will only become more common if we continue to fail to intervene and adapt. There is a broader impact from these fires on the global stage as well. Wildfires release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at the same time as they are destroying carbon sinks. The burned areas are often repopulated with invasive plants, and in some cases, this can reduce the area's ability to take in and store carbon by up to 90%. That makes these fires part of a climate feedback loop. Atmospheric warming increases the risk and severity of fires, and more severe fires increase the greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere. To complicate matters in the United States, incoming President Donald Trump has a history of politicizing disaster response and an unwillingness to follow the strategies and science presented to him by experts in wildland fire management. This means we can expect a lot of friction in the U.S.'s engagement with wildland fire risk factors and also emissions as a whole. As a result, the world's second highest emitting country will likely contribute even more to climate change while simultaneously reducing the efficiency of its natural carbon sinks. The one small silver lining here is that severe fires such as these burn up so much of the available fuel that there's often a window of reprieve before another round of large fires. This is the time in which land managers and developers can rebuild and restore areas in alignment with the natural and unavoidable fire regime of this region. In this particular case, there are some preparations that would not only protect lives and property, but would also encourage healthy ecosystems going forward. Establishing natural buffer zones between the native chaparral and structures is one key consideration, as well as replanting and cultivating native species instead of invasive ones, which alter fire regimes. These fires are worst case scenario tragedy, and if we do not pay attention to the lessons that can be drawn from them, there is no doubt they will happen again. But if we encourage our politicians and those in power to rebuild with consideration of this hazard, we might stand a chance of living peacefully right. alongside its inevitability.